Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, so my name is Enzo Melli. I'm the organizer of the Cosin London Meetup. Um, I work for UI Wallet, and I'm an Android developer. Uh, the reason why I'm the organizer of the Kotlin Meetup is because I use Kotlin in production since two years. And thanks to UI Wallet, they let me give me the opportunity to learn it uh, on the job. So what is Yo-Yo? So we have Kotlin in production since 2015. Uh, our code base is 100% in Kotlin. Uh, we're crash free session of 99.9% .9 and 100% happiness because Kotlin, <laughs> especially compared to Java, yeah, it's much more uh, available. Uh, so we just not do uh, our app UU Wallet. Uh, we build also the Cafe Nero app in, uh, this year and its code base is uh, uh, totally in, in, uh, in Kotlin. So, but you're not here, I'm talking about me. Uh, so we have two great talks tonight. Uh, the first is uh, Mike, Mike Hearn, uh, and second, Hadi. But before, I have to introduce uh, uh, the host of the tonight of the Telegraph is a uh, tech leader of the Telegraph, Ciro Rizzo. Thanks. Thank you. I'll be very short, don't worry, guys. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not the, the actual host. I'm not, I cannot pay, I cannot afford the rent <laughs> for a big house like this. So it'll be nice. So uh, before starting, guys, so uh, thank you for coming uh, uh, to the Telegraph, uh, to uh, the Kotlin uh, meetup. So uh, just a quick note. Uh, in case you need uh, services, are uh, accessing one of the two doors here, that way. Uh, in case, you know, emergency, there are stairs where you just had some nibbles and drinks. So uh, that's is something I have to say, you know. <laughs> All right. So I am a Chiorizzo tech lead for uh, the mobile team. Um, for, uh, I'm look after for the, 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 the main flagship app uh, for the Telegraph especially for the Android team. So what we're doing here at the Telegraph? As you, as you can imagine, we, uh, uh, the Telegraph is a, is a company uh, working in the media, in the media business, and uh, is holding this uh, business for a long time, something like 162 years old. Uh, behind you, you can see uh, what everything happened. So basically the newsroom. Uh, where all the editors and journalists uh, wrap up the news, breaking news, wrapping the edition of the of the, the newspaper, the printed and the digital as well. <laughs> so just to give you just a few numbers on uh, what we're doing here. So the Telegraph Digital, so we wrap up the, uh, uh, the news, the content produced by the, by the editors in a few formats. And the digital can have some, uh, uh, as you can see, huge number of viewers. So uh, 100 millions of page view monthly. Uh, 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 15,000 stories a month, videos. Uh, a lot of people working around uh, this business. And we're helping them to uh, digitalize the version of the app, working on the, mainly on the two uh, flagship app. One is the, the Telegraph app. There is the li uh, live feed uh, app uh, version. And the newspaper edition app, that is a version of the app that is much more like uh, the printed edition. So it gives you the chance to have your reading of the, the edition uh, in the same way as the printed one. And uh, we are proud now to announce that we have a new, uh, a new app uh, at the Telegraph. Uh, in the in the family of the mobile apps, that basically is Gojimo app. That Gojimo is our app. It's a free app to uh, help students to get their achievements. So, as a lots of, uh, it's an educational app. So, basically helping the people um, that have to achieve their GSE uh, exams, and they can create their own uh, exam boards, and they have thousands and thousands of quizzes, and they can get track all the. Uh, um, the, the 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 result and the progress of the, the the students. So this is a new app is now available on the store. <coughs> so well, just finish and give finally the, the words to the speakers. Uh, we are hiring in case, as you know, and please 
follow us, especially the uh, there is some tags on the on the on the, on the paper on the on the walls. So follow the hashtag, Telegraph Eng, tweeting. Please help us to growing up our um, our social uh, community. So that's it. So now the word to Mike. Right. There we go. Okay, so a little bit different today. I am a Kotlin developer, um, but not on Android. So this this talk is not about Android, um, and uh, it's also uh, it's not uh, an introduction to Kotlin. By the way, I should warn you now. This this talk assumes you know Kotlin already. This is more for the people who are more a bit more advanced, and also for our friends at JetBrains, Hadi, because we're going to be discussing our experiences of the last two years of building enterprise uh, software with Kotlin. So, um, you know, you won't have heard of us, I think, so I should introduce us. I'm here, by the way, with um, uh, Rich Green. Where are you, Richard? Ah, at the back. Well, that's no good. <laughs> so Rich Green is on our developer relations team. And, uh, you know, if you want to find out more, you can talk to me or him afterwards. Uh, so. You know, what, what, what is R3 and what is this thing we've been building, this, this quarter product? And uh, what's it got to do with finance and Kotlin? Mm. So, R3, it's simultaneously, this is a bit weird, simultaneously a startup, but also a large consortium of banks. Now, I didn't know such a thing could exist until I joined R3, but it does. We have over 100 members, the world's largest banks and, and financial institutions. Uh, we've raised uh, over $100 million in funding. And the reason is, the reason it's so big, um, is that we are building a database platform for people who don't trust each other, which might sound a bit odd because finance is a very trust-based industry. But um, R3 came out of the, the hype and excitement around blockchain technology, which in turn came out of, of course, the world of Bitcoin and Ethereum and so on. And Quarter is not Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's a different thing. But um, the basic idea is to uh, let people work together and share data in flexible ways, um, but uh, assuming that they don't really uh, trust each other that much. Right? So Corda is about improving how businesses work together uh, by replacing the very message-oriented systems they use today. Right? The standard way that uh, companies work together is they send each other a message. In finance, they use networks like Swift to do that, for example. Maybe they send a bit of XML. Uh, but what they really want to do is actually uh, synchronize uh, views of the world. They want to synchronize their databases. And um, as a result, you know, because these message-oriented systems are a bit flaky and a bit imprecise and a bit loose, uh, they often get out of sync with each other. And it, it, they, they, they spend enormous amounts of money and time just keeping their databases uh, synchronized with each other. And the reason they haven't solved this by just you know, shoving everything into a giant Oracle instance, for example, is um, you know, no one is trustworthy enough to run the database that contains the financial system. Right? You can't do it. There's no, there's no one who is angelic enough in the world, who is pure of heart enough to do that. So they persist with this sort of very um, ad hoc kind of system, which breaks down all the time, but it's still better than trusting someone to run the entire financial system in a database. So if you could build a database that everyone could share, you could solve this. And this, of course, has applications. It's not only finance, which is where we're focused, because finance is paying for it, basically, but also healthcare and cargo shipping. And uh, you could do you know, Bitcoin-style um, sort of mobile e-cash, for example. You could do supply chain integrity uh, management, all kinds of interesting use cases that you know, people are still thinking of and finding cases for. Uh, but it turns out that things like finance and healthcare are really the places where you get lots and lots of institutions and businesses and organizations that need to work together in complex ways. So that's what we do. But this talk isn't really about Corda, actually. It's about Kotlin. So I'm not going to talk a lot more about uh, what it actually is. Um, but, you know, if you're interested, you should check it out because it's, it's not as boring as it sounds. There's quite interesting computer science in there, actually. So, you know, there's, firstly, it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, peer-to-peer -peer system. And it's uh, got a lot of inspiration in it from Bitcoin. There's lots of cryptography. Uh, we're exploring what well, we are, in fact, uh, already using, things like um, Intel SGX, which is a new feature in their chips that lets you set up hardware-encrypted memory spaces, uh, you know, physically secure hardware. 
We use, uh, we use coroutines to model and, and uh, execute uh, network protocols and business processes. So if you don't know about coroutines, then just watch out for Hardy's talk, which comes next, and tell you about that. A lot of uh, large type safe API for solving business problems. And, and it's open source, too, because you know, if it wasn't, then we would be the ones running the global database that held the financial system. And that's not the point, right? So all of our investors and our members and our customers insist that it be open source. Our business model is we make a better version of the open source version and we run a network and we provide various services and things and people pay for that. But you can go check it out. It's on GitHub and we've got a website at quarter.net. All right. So who am I? Well, um, I'm the lead platform engineer on Corda. Um, I wrote the first code. Uh, I, uh, I, I basically initiated this project. It's, I'm the reason it uses Kotlin. Um, I was a, a very early user of Bitcoin. I, I used it in 2009, four months after release. And um, back then, the only way to find out what it did or how it worked was to email Satoshi Nakamoto. So I did that a lot, and, and we, we had a whole bunch of exchanges back when I thought such a guy really existed. Um, and then in 2010, I became a Bitcoin developer, and I did that for five years. Um, I did all sorts of things in the Bitcoin space. Um, I, I upgraded the, the core protocol. I designed extensions to it. I, I, did, uh, I, I educated the first news outlets like CNN and, and uh, the BBC and the Telegraph and so on of what this thing was. Spent a lot of time with the press. But I mostly I wrote Bitcoin J, which became the most widely used Bitcoin library for Java. Uh, and you can see it's a nice logo here. Lots and lots of apps built on top of Bitcoin J, and those apps went on to have millions of users. So about, I think, 2.5 million wallets were created with Bitcoin J. And this was a side project, which is what was absolutely terrifying about it. It was a real, uh, you know, wet to the bed sort of project from beginning to <laughs> the time I left it. Because it, at that time, I actually had a day job. Um, I was an engineer at Google for nearly eight years. And Bitcoin J was like a side project. And you don't really want side projects setting up controlling hundreds of millions of dollars of value. That's not much fun. But that's what happened. Uh, we didn't anticipate it, but that's what happened. And then, of course, finally, I was a Kotlin early adopter, which is why I'm here today. So um, I went and I looked at my GitHub repository to find out when I, f I couldn't quite remember when I first started using it, but I found that I've submitted a patch to the Kotlin website in 2014. So I guess I must have started using it a bit before that. This was long before Kotlin 1.0. Um, I was self-employed for a couple of years, and I built what a sort of peer-to-peer -peer Kickstarter app that used the Bitcoin protocol. And I think I introduced, uh, I, I, I know I introduced Kotlin into that in February 2015. So I've been using it for quite a while. Um, and that's, that is one of the things that led me here today, right, talking to you. So, Corda and Kotlin. As you may have guessed, Corda is written in Kotlin. Specifically, over 100,000 lines of it by now. Uh, I have a team of 25 developers working for me. The, we've done a global training program. When I say we, I mean people like Richard, actually, <laughs> not me personally. Uh, we've graduated uh, nearly 500 people trained in this platform, and the training is done in, in Kotlin. Uh, the, the graduates, uh, the, the people who take the course can use Java as well, and some of them do. You, you don't have to write quarter applications in Kotlin, of course. You can use Java too, and we fully support that. And around 4,500 commits on GitHub. The code base is mostly Kotlin, or almost entirely Kotlin. There's a little bit of Java, but that Java is mostly sample code. So it's there for people who don't care about Kotlin, don't want to use it. They just want to use Java, and we provide sample code for them. So that's, that's where that 5% comes from. So it's quite a bit. It's quite a big project at this point. Probably one of the largest Kotlin projects out there, except maybe the Kotlin compiler itself, I would guess. All right. Now, a few of you came here to be sold on Kotlin. I think most of you didn't. Most of you already like it. So I'm not going to spend too much time on why we picked Kotlin, because I think most of you know already. Uh, but you know, we were very you know, we were very keen. I say we, I was very keen. And I was the first developer after we hired. And uh, they hired me because of the work I did on Bitcoin J and other things, so I had a lot of leeway to make my own decisions. Uh, I have a very trusting boss, fortunately. My CTO is pretty good. So we started using Kotlin before 1.0 even shipped. That was, of course, kind of risky because our clients are banks, not organizations famous for their a uh, rapid embrace of uh, new technologies that are not stable yet. <laughs> but it worked, you know, it, it was a calculated risk. So um, I knew that Kotlin would go to 1.0 very soon after we started using it, so I wasn't too worried about this. Right? I, I've been following the project, this was in the um, end of 2015, right? So I've been using Kotlin for over a year by that point. I developed a lot of trust in the JetBrains team. Um, I could see they were serious, this was going to happen, and so I knew 1.0 would ship. So it was a calculated risk, and it worked. Um, uh, we, we were actually pretty happy we made this decision, got no regrets, would do it again. 
you know, my boss actually likes to use this story. He says, uh, oh, agonized over this decision. You know, I hired this guy and he starts using this crazy language I never heard of. Why, you know, this is a clear sign of impending disaster, right, usually. Uh, but it, it actually worked out very well. Um, and why did it work out well? And it's not because of, you know, nice short syntax or anything like that. Basically, it, it enabled us to, you know, we've been able to hire a pretty good team. Um, it's taken nearly two years, but, you know, there's 25 plus developers. I'm really happy with them. So we were able to get really good developers, and they're happy devs. And, you know, good devs who are happy are very productive. And they like their job. And, it, and, um, and that, in fact, and, and if people know that they're going to be happy and productive, that makes it easier to hire, actually. And we've had people come to us and say, I'd like to work for you. And they, 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 we, we code test them, and they do really well in the interviews. Um, and the reason they approached us is they said, you know, any, com any company that's willing to make a move like that uh, is a place I want to work, because we're, we're going to do things, uh, you know, we're going to use good tools. So that sort of is a pretty good move, uh, we feel. So I'm, you know, <clears throat> I'm not going to sing JetBrains praises more, because they hear it a lot. Of course, they, they know we're all fans. So I want to talk a bit about the challenges that came with using Kotlin as well, because it's not all plain sailing, of course. So Corda exposes a large Java API. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's expansive, right? It has classes for modeling uh, identities, like business like legal identities and so on. It has classes for cryptography. It has classes for network protocols and creating business processes on top of those network protocols. It has classes for modeling uh, database transactions and amounts of money and interest rate swaps and all kinds of things. So, it's a fairly large API, and we are a startup, um, and we have competitors. One of our competitors is IBM, uh, not a company you know, famous for being small or resource limited. So uh, we have huge time pressure, and that's the primary source of our challenges, right? So, and the reason we were able to use Kotlin to do this, create this large Java API, is because Kotlin's interop is so very good. And it is very good, but it, it's not entirely perfect, right? So um, I'm going to get into ways that's not entirely perfect later. So if, you, if any of you, I think many of you are Android developers, you're not creating Java APIs for use by other people, but maybe a few of you are, or you will be in future. So I'm going to go into our experiences with that. Um, obviously, you know, being a very early adopter means uh, that we, that was a challenge all by itself. Um, uh, so um, coroutines, you know, this is a very uh, useful and important technique, and we're very, um, we're on the JVM, we're quite early adopters of that too. Now, Kotlin coroutines didn't exist, of course, at the time we started this. Uh, but, and we have to support Java users anyway, so we actually use a framework called Quasar to provide um, continuations, much like the ones you're going to hear about soon, but which are Java compatible. Quasar is a, a very interesting library. It works by, um, it registers as an agent with a JVM, and it actually uh, does, a, it's basically a bytecode recompiler, and it statically analyzes and rewrites and recompiles your bytecode on the fly to turn ordinary code into a um, non-blocking state machine. And in fact, the guy who wrote Quasar has been hired by Oracle and is now integrating this technology into the JVM itself. So if you had any doubt about whether continuations are worth learning about, the fact that it's a, going to become a key part of the Java platform should put that uh, you know, uh, to one side. Um, and, and you'll learn more about uh, the non-Quasar form in Hardy's talk. And finally, of course, none of the team knew Kotlin before they joined. Every single one of my team learned it on the job. Um, and we didn't even advertise we were using Kotlin, actually, because there's no point. No one knew it, so why bother advertising that? Um, so that was a bit of a challenge, but actually not a big one. Most people were able to pick it up in a few days, which is really nothing right, relative to the benefits we get. So what rocks? Well, the thing that rocks the most is that everyone loves Kotlin. So the team is really happy. Um, we, we, hired, we had one contractor who came in, and he hated it for some reason. He couldn't explain why. Um, but he wanted to write everything in Lisp. And when we said... <laughs> When we said we don't use Lisp, he said, well, how about I write things in Lisp and you pay a contractor in India to rewrite it into Kotlin? <laughs> uh, except for him, everyone has loved Kotlin. And what's uh, really nice, actually, is not only the team we've hired love it, uh, but our users do too. And even though we fully support Java and we, we train people on how to write Java apps and we expected most people to write their apps in Java, um, actually, because they are at banks and they have policies about such things, actually, many of them um, have found ways to use Kotlin anyway. And they actually are very happy that uh, they can do this partly because blockchain is hyped and you know, in, in fin finance is very fashionable right now. So that kind of gives them a bit more leeway to use these more exotic tools and they, they really like it. And, and some of these large investment banks, I've been told by the people who work there, are now um, you know, deploying Kotlin internally. They don't talk about it, but they, they are actually using it. 
Um, this really rocked. So I thought two years after adopting uh, Kotlin, I would still be arguing with users about it every day. You know, I thought this is going to be an uphill struggle from beginning to end. And, this is, and even though you can use Java, uh, people are going to be getting annoyed at me and saying, why didn't you write your, your app in Java? But this hasn't happened. Um, and in fact, you know, big companies and big projects like Google and Spring and so on have adopted it far faster than I ever anticipated they would. And this really helps, right? If you're, using, if you're in the enterprise space, this really helps a lot. And that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, people just pick this up and they see that it's good and, they, and you know, the usual delays and problems you expect with new languages, they just fall away. Um, we couldn't use Kotlin without this feature, right? The, the, I, I would never have been able to use it because I knew we were doing a Java API, so, but you can generate a real Java API right, with Kotlin and it takes almost no overhead, right? I say it's hardly any, it's not zero, but there's a very small amount of overhead to generate something that's basically a real Java API. And that's amazing. And I already mentioned, you know, we got some people on my team came to us and they had other options. They could have gone to many companies, but they came to us because they saw we were making this decision and using Kotlin, and they said, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I want to work with tools that make me happy. And uh, when, when I say real Java API, what do I mean? Uh, Docker, Docker can generate Java docs. This is a bit of a, not a very well-known feature, but it will actually generate, you know, a, a Java doc site that looks as if, and it uses Java syntax for all of your API documentation, and it looks like a Java API. And the Java developer, there are a few glitches here or there. It is an imposter. It's not the real thing, but it does a really damn good impression. And this, this helps a lot, you know? If you don't want to know about Kotlin, you don't have to. It will look exactly as if you are building on top of something like the JDK, which is great. I love that. And we use DSLs, we use domain-specific languages, we use Tornado FX. Tornado FX is a, uh, a framework which sits on top of Java FX, so it's for doing GUIs. I'll talk more about that in a bit. But one of the things that I like, I mean, I like lots of things about Tornado FX, but I have a special place in my heart for it because the guy who created it, um, he came to Kotlin, he picked up Kotlin because uh, he read a blog post I wrote about how great it was. So I didn't do any work to create Tornado FX, but I claim a little bit of credit anyway. You gotta, you gotta claim credit where you can, and uh, it's pretty nice. But you know, there are things that could have rocked more, right? It's not all perfect. So um, yes, so most of the new efforts that JetBrains are making don't actually help us. So we can't use Kotlin continuations because we need to support Java users. We can't use Kotlin serialization for the same reason. We've built our own serialization engine because we needed something uh, a bit more fancy than like Java serialization or Cryo or JSON. Uh, can't use Kotlin native because we depend on a lot of Java libraries. So, uh, you know, JetBrains, and, and I'm not saying these are worthless by any means. These are very nice. Um, these are very, very nice implementations of the concepts, right? Kotlin serialization is nice and the continuations are very nice as well. Um, I haven't tried Kotlin native, uh, I've read about it, but I, uh, I'm sure that's very nice too. You know, I have a lot of confidence in these things. But they don't really help us, and that's a bit of a bummer, you know. But, you know, I'm not complaining because JetBrains have given all this stuff away for free, and that's a massive help to us already, so it would be, it would be bad to complain. The, you know, this is great stuff, and we may well use it in future, but for now, at least, most of the work that's going into Kotlin doesn't actually help us. Um, Early adopters bleed sometimes. Now, the Kotlin compiler has been very stable, and um, uh, the tools are pretty good, but uh, the IDE for the first 18 months or so uh, uh, crashed a lot, <laughs> right, a lot of exceptions. Um, and uh, all of our team, you know, would experience this multiple times a day at points. Now, things seem to be a lot more stable lately. I say the first 18 months, and we're now nearly two years into this project, right? So things have got a lot better. <laughs> or it's, I'm doing less coding because I'm management, so it's possible I just don't notice. But I think it's more stable. When I use it for my own projects, it seems more stable, so that's good. Um, you know, whenever there's a new version of Kotlin, right, your IDE starts saying, you should upgrade, you should upgrade, and that's great. But if you upgrade your plugin, then it starts saying, you've got to upgrade your runtime library and upgrade your runtime library. But if you've got a team of 25 people, then, then not everyone upgrades at once, right? So that, there's always some warning flashing on the screen about version skew, which is sort of a bit annoying. It's not the end of the world by any means. Uh, but we always we are very frequently running with IDE plugins that don't match the runtime version because you know they come out frequently and um, and, and it takes time for people to upgrade. Uh, so yes, very very good Java interop, not entirely perfect, and we really want to get perfect. Um, we're actually you know we submit pull requests and things to JetBrains uh, in some of these areas because not I don't think uh, any other projects are doing what we're doing really. I think there's one at Square maybe, but this is a bit you know we're doing things a bit unusually. And um, finally, uh, you know, IntelliJ is really amazing, um, but most team members don't know the best tricks, right? So I, whenever I watch uh, members of my team write code, I'm always like, mm, uh, 
mm, because they're, they're not using all the keyboard shortcuts. So they're like, oh, they missed a refactoring they could have used to just shave off half a second of that thing they did. And, and um, you know, and the, the amazing thing about IntelliJ is you can go really fast if you learn it well, like really fast. And, uh, but you need to know the tricks. Um, and I know you can go really fast, and it, it is uh, something that impresses people because uh, before I joined R3 and when I was doing, I was self-employed and I was doing Bitcoin development, I, I gave a talk at a Bitcoin conference. And it, was a, it wasn't a talk, actually, it was a live coding session. So for half an hour, I wrote a, a Bitcoin blockchain app from scratch uh, on stage. And uh, it was an app that uh, you gave it a document. It had a GUI, and you gave it a document, and it put a, it put a hash of the document into the Bitcoin blockchain. So it was a timestamping app, right? You could sort of prove your document existed at that point in time. And it was just written from scratch. And um, I practiced because, you know, it's quite a complex app to write in half an hour. And uh, so, uh, but I wanted to make it fit. So I practiced it a few times before I did it. And then, you know, after the talk, I expected people to ask questions about the cryptography of it or about the Bitcoin of it or whatever. But actually, most people just said, wow, I didn't realize anyone could ever code that fast. You know, they said, uh, I've never seen anyone use an IDE like that because if you remember, you know, I've been doing coding by myself for two years at that point just because I was self employed. So I've learned all the tricks. And um, it's, you, you, you can double your speed of coding if you know what you're doing and you're not, um, and you already have it in your mind what you want to code. So that's pretty amazing, but it's hard to learn these tricks. So I want to make a video for my team, but this is an area where, you know, uh, JetBrains is leaving fans on the floor here a bit because they don't realize how, uh, how much it can help them. So I want to go into a bit of specifics now. If you don't know Kotlin, this bit might be a bit confusing or boring. Sorry about that, but um, you know it's uh, it's really for Hattie <laughs> and the JetBrains guys. And I'm I'm going I'm going to Kotlin Conf uh, next month, and I want to find Andre and grab him and, and, and throttle him until he agrees to fix these things. So uh, well, they're not really bugs. They're not not problems in Kotlin. But here's I want to give you examples of mistakes that we've made over the time when building a Java API in Kotlin. So. Default arguments, very handy, very handy indeed. You can use them from Java, but you, have to, you don't get the default arguments, right? You have to specify all of the uh, arguments yourself, unless you annotate the method with this magic annotation, and then it generates the overloads. Why isn't it done by default? I don't know. Save some space in the class file or something, but it's really easy to forget this. And we forget it all the time, and then someone writes a sample, code sample in Java, and we notice it's sort of sucky, and we go and add it. Same thing for static annotations, right? So Kotlin has this notion of a companion object. And it's conceptually a lot nicer than static methods, which are a bit of a weird kludge in the JVM and, and in the language. So companion objects are you know, theoretically nicer. But it's not Java. And Java developers don't expect to see them. And you can make static methods in Kotlin, but they forward onto the companion object. So the companion object sits around polluting your API. It doesn't go away. Um, and if you forget, then you know, you're back to the weird sort of non-entirely Java-ish API, which is a shame. They appear in the Java docs too, even if all the methods are static, which is annoying. Um, in, in, so KDoc is really nice. It's nicer than Java doc. It's like markdown based, and it's just really tasteful, as is so much in Kotlin. Uh, but there are actually multiple ways of uh, describing constructor parameters. And if you pick the wrong one, again, it doesn't make any difference to the code the Java docs will just look wrong. And when do you notice this? Well, of course, three days before you're about to ship your API when you're doing it once over on the, on the Java docs. Easy to forget to make stuff private because the default is public. You can't suppress internal packages. And so these are things which only people like us will hit, right? We want to present a really nice Java API. And the tools are almost there, but they're just these little grains of sand that just get in your shoes. And what does internal visibility do anyway? Right? What does it compile to? Can anyone here put your hands up if you could tell me what an internal method compiles to at the level of JVM bytecode? You, sir, are my friend. <laughs> no one else can tell me this. I mean, obviously, you know, I, mean, I don't know. I know you. It's easy to look it up, right? There's a bytecode viewer, but um, you know, what's you know, I've got to, you know, people have got to learn this, right? It's not in the docs or anything like that. So. Um, Kotlin types leaking into a theoretically Java-based API. So the worst offender here is K function, of course, because you define a nice Kotlin lambda and um, up pops K function. Um, I'm not sure this really matters. We cleansed the API of Kotlin.pair and a few other things before we released it, but we tried to get rid of K function, and it just Kotlin really doesn't want you to use Java SAM interfaces. That's like it almost did, it could. But it, it sort of deliberately makes the code ugly if you want to use that, because it's sort of trying to nudge you away from it. And that's a bit annoying. We, we tried uh, cleansing the API of K functions so we wouldn't export any Kotlin types in the API. But then that just made all of our Kotlin code ugly, so we were like, oh, screw it. You know, it's not actually that big of a deal, because the Kotlin API is stable too. 
you get these, you know, it's very easy to get these foo KT classes popping up everywhere like mushrooms, because any time you declare a top level function, Kotlin synthesizes this class with this weird name. And only Java users see the KT suffix. So of course, you, you forget until you generate Java docs, and then you're like, oh, what are all these ugly classes with KT at the end? So that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a shame. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other things. You know, it's very easy to, to spam the, the namespace of top-level functions and things. We tried Exposed, which is a little sort of side project by JetBrains, and it's pretty cool. Uh, but we ended up having to rip it out because it wasn't really mature enough, so we ended up going back to Hibernate. Um, this is a, a specific instance of a more general mistake I think it's easy to make, where you find a cool Kotlin library and it's got this nice DSL, and you think, great, I'll use it. And then, but it's just not, you know, it's just not mature enough. Even if it's just really wrapping a Java API, um, it takes quite a lot of work to make a library. And of course, Kotlin is young, so some of these libraries, they don't have that much work put into them. All right, so here's my wish list. I told you this talk wasn't really for you guys, <laughs> but I couldn't resist the opportunity to, to you know, get, get what I want in front of the JetBrains uh, people. So, so these are things that would make um, our lives easier and the lives I think anyone making a Java API uh, easier. Right, or enterprise software where you can, a, a Corda app, by the way, is a plugin to a node. Um, so it's like an app container, right? It's like a J2E sort of app container. You put your jar in a magic directory and it gets loaded. So that's why we export this Java API. So um, there's a bit of discussion about this already, but it'd be really nice if like the compiler, so the compiler's defaults are designed really for people writing like Android apps and things. They're really designed for people um, you know, like everything is public by default, and the, it won't insist on documentation, and all these defaults make a ton of sense. Um, and we have modules in the code which are not exporting API, and the defaults make a ton of sense there. But slightly different defaults would help a lot when designing an API. For example, um, if you define a function and you rely on type inference for the, for the result type, it's very easy to end up having a function that returns a slightly different type than what you actually intended. This is bitten as already, We've only had stable API for three days. We put in place a tool that like catches people changing the API, and so all these things are now coming up as people try and fix them. Um, and you know, people don't always—they don't have always have the discipline to write Java docs. And I'm I'm a bit fascist about that, so I'd like that to be a warning that I can turn into an error. Um, and, and you know, there are a bunch of things where you could just make them errors when designing a public API, where the tools kind of let you do things that are not really ideal. Um, yeah, so Kotlin doesn't actually, it has a mode where it pretends to generate Java 8 bytecode, and you think, great, I'll enable that, but it doesn't actually do anything different, which is a bit of a shame. Um, and in particular, for things like if you want to add a default method to an interface, this can bite you. Java 8 has nice support for this, because the Java designers needed it themselves to evolve their own API, but Kotlin doesn't use it. And even worse, it turns out it's hard to add without breaking Kotlin's own backwards compatibility. But in this case, I would sacrifice that. It's kind of an edge case that stops them adding this, and I would sacrifice that to get better support for evolving a Java API. Likewise, you know, missing annotations. It'll be not, you know, IntelliJ can hint so much stuff to you if you get it not quite right. An intention for this would be really good. Or just making make something the default. All they do is add extra methods. They don't bother anyone if they're, if they're there. So why not just make it the default? It, it's sort of annoying that we, we forget this so frequently and this is such a common class of bug and it's kind of needless, you know, in my view. Um, <clears throat> Jigsaw, yes. Java 9 is now shipped. We're not upgraded yet, maybe next year, but um, when we do, uh, we'd like to use Jigsaw. It has a lot of features that would help us, so support for that. I think mostly it's kind of there, but it's not completely there. Docker is such a fantastic tool, it almost, it really deserves love and attention, and it's a little bit of a side project, so, um, you know, I've filed a bunch of bugs, and, and someone on my team has submitted, is going to submit a pull request today, or tomorrow, actually, but, it, it, you know, it, it's so nearly there, um, it's like 90% ideal that just a little bit of work would push it over the finishing line and make it perfectly ideal. Um, so that would be nice. And then finally, my pet peeve, I can't, <laughs> we use Team City. Uh, we pay for this, but we can't use it from IntelliJ because of the login doesn't work. Oh, and by the way, the Telegraph app has the same issue. I can't log into the Telegraph app because uh, my account is linked to Facebook. That's, my, that's nothing to do with Kotlin. I just figured I've got my feature request while I'm on stage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, future fun. Fun, fun, fun. Word you see a lot when writing Kotlin. Uh, we would like to, uh, so, so Corda is for finance, and um, you know security is a big deal there. So we'd like to start sandboxing apps and components of the node using the JVM sandboxing techniques. Uh, Type-based security is something that most people are not familiar with. Um, and it's not conceptually that hard to grasp, but it is very sensitive to the details of how things are compiled. For example, um, it would be tempting to think that if you mark a Kotlin method as internal, 
that means um, you know it can't be called uh, by code outside that module. But it's not true because an internal method compiles to I think public method, right? It's uh, it's actually not really restricted from the JVM's perspective because the JVM doesn't know about internal, uh, and that can that, that can that can potentially cause sandbox escapes. Um, you know, we, I mentioned we use Tornado effects and Java effects. Why is that, right? Why don't we write web apps? Uh, the main reason is I, I don't believe it's possible to write secure web apps at all, right? I think if you try this, you will always fail. Um, can you put your hand up here if you're a web developer? What, none? <laughs> you're all Android developers. Okay, I've got a few, not many. Can you put your hand up if you've heard of SSRF exploits? Oh, a few. SSRF, not XSRF. Did you get that distinction? SSRF, to do with bugs and URL passes. Still know about it? No. You can't write secure web apps. Not possible. Too many gotchas. Yet, you know, if we get one XSS exploit in the control plane app for uh, um, a piece of software that manages hundreds of millions of dollars in interest rate swaps, that's bad. And you can steal a lot of money that way. So we, we write our UI in JavaFX because it's, it makes us invulnerable to things like XSS, XSRF, but also SSRF and all the other odd exploit types you've never heard of, like the beast attack, the heist attack, um, you know, path traversal attacks, header splitting attacks. I've tried to hire web developers who know about all these different things and it can't be done. So we use JavaFX. <laughs> Um, but, you know, then desktop apps have their own problems, right? Like deployment is kind of sucky. Um, and JetBrains have made this really nice thing called Toolbox, which sort of solves that. You know, it does auto updates and you, it's a sort of like Steam for their own apps. I would so much like to use this. <laughs> you know, the alternative is we write our own. I actually did write my own uh, when I was self-employed for the app, uh, for the peer-to-peer the, the the, the -peer Kickstarter thing that I told you about. Um, and we could use that and make it better, but, you know, Toolbox is there and it's so nice. Um, uh, you know, I'll happily, I'll happily pay JetBrains for this. <laughs> so, uh, finally, language features. I'm, I'm actually pretty happy. I don't really think there are that many features that, uh, you know, could add those sort of better generics, maybe type classes, some more advanced type theory, but not that's not everyone's cup of tea. And I think JetBrains are better at me, better at designing languages than I am, so I don't really want to argue with them about this. I tried a few times. Before Kotlin reached 1.0, I, I got into a few arguments with Andre about, oh, you should do this differently or that differently, and uh, he always beat me. You know, he always had some good reason why it was done that way that I hadn't thought of. So I don't want to dwell too much on that. Kotlin's pretty good as it is. Um, yes, yeah, mostly about tools, actually, in the end. So that's, uh, that's my talk. <laughs>